But here, let's do a volume or a revolution where we're going to do something a little different. We're going to revolve around the y axis instead of the x axis. The region we're going to revolve, though, will still involve the region between two graphs of two functions of x. The top function here is going to be y equals x squared. The bottom function is going to be y equals x cubed, which may look a little confusing because, wait a minute, doesn't x cubed grow faster than x squared? Yes, once x is bigger than 1, it does. But when x is between 0 and 1, x squared is actually above x cubed. Just a little fact worth knowing. I could revolve this around the x-axis, but for some variety, let's revolve it around the y-axis. And it also has the benefit that when you do so, you make a bowl instead of a horn. It might be nice to have a bowl to eat our cereal out of after we revolve it around the y-axis. Of course, this is not going to be a bowl you'd actually want to eat cereal in. because it's very thin at the bottom <laughs> and you'd probably get a hole in the bowl and then all your milk and cereal would fall at the bottom. If you lifted it off the counter, it's so, it would be so weak at the bottom that it would all probably instantly make a hole and fall out because there's no, no width right there. It's like one molecule thick or something. It's thicker here and here. And when I say I'm after the volume of this thing, I don't mean how much cereal and milk can you put in it. I don't mean that volume. I mean the volume of the solid itself, which means the, the bowl itself. How much material do you need for the bowl? Okay, that's the volume I'm after. Is this really practical? Nobody would make a bowl like that, would they? It's not the bowl itself that's the practical thing to think about here. It's the modeling skill you are gaining by thinking this way. Ultimately, an example of a situation that's more significant to apply this skill includes examples like with center of mass in physics, where you've got some three dimensional object that's maybe not a, it's sort of maybe some strange blob like an asteroid, for example, out in space. And its density is not uniform. You know, it's got different, different uh, mineral deposits in different spots, iron in certain spots, and I don't know what else, cobalt in other spots. And that means its density is not constant. Theoretically, you can still set up integrals to represent the center of mass, and it might be worthwhile to do so in such situations. So you need these skills. Now you might, might be saying, I'm never going to work for NASA or even SpaceX, but uh, Okay, what, but you might, you might, you never know. Where is God leading you? You might have to work for them or you might want to work for them. We're gonna slice it perpendicular to the y-axis this time. Why? Because that's the axis of revolution for one thing. More importantly, because it's the axis of revolution, the cross sections perpendicular to the y-axis are gonna be circular or to be a little bit more careful about it, thin rings. There's really a, a hole in the middle there of that cross section. And the small width of the cross section, we'll go ahead and call delta y. Actually, it's more traditional to call this a washer than a, than a ring. I mean, it, it could be like a ring. But it's even more like a washer that you would use like with a screw, right? Screw the screw into the wall with a washer there to hold it better. So the cross section is a washer, as in with screws and washers. 
But yes, it's also could be called it also could be called a ring. And in this case, it is a pretty thin ring because those two function graphs are close together. In the video I made yesterday, I called the inner radius of this R sub in for inner and the outer radius R sub out for outer. outer. The textbook uses little r for the inner radius that's smaller than big r for the outer radius. And we do want to know the cross sectional area of this thing, not including the whole. That cross sectional area is what we want to figure out. And it's really going to be the function that we integrate with respect to y instead of x because y is what's varying in this case from zero to one as I slice perpendicular to the y-axis. It is ultimately a function of y. If I was slicing perpendicular to the x-axis, it would be a function of x. And it's not that I couldn't slice this thing perpendicular to the x-axis, it's just that the cross sections would be very complicated if I did so. More complicated. At least. It's better to slice it perpendicular to the y axis. The area is what is shaded. That's the area between two circles. So it's the area of the bigger circle minus the area of the smaller circle. Pi times capital R of y quantity squared minus pi times little r of y quantity squared. And I didn't write of y's in the picture, but they do depend on y. They are functions of y. And yeah, you could factor out the pi and write it like this. And that's going to be the function we integrate, y. That's where the Riemann sum hand wavy stuff comes into play. I go back up here and I think about the small volume of that thin slice, call that small volume delta V. Pretending the sides are vertical, which they're not, I could say the volume of that is approximately the cross sectional area times delta Y, where the cross sectional area is the same as this thing down here. And the total volume of the entire bowl as being the sum of the little volumes, which would be approximately sums like this. And then you let delta y go to zero. And that's where the magic happens. And you pretend the summation time sign turns into an integral. The a of y stays as it is. The delta y turns into a dy. And we do need to know the right limits of integration. Looking at the picture, y goes up from 0 to 1. y goes from 0 to 1. And then plug in the function. Integrate from 0 to 1, pi times capital R of y squared minus little r of y squared. But obviously we're not done. We haven't figured out what capital R and little r are. What we've done is hard enough as it is, it is still tricky to figure out capital R and little r. Question? Yeah, so are we technically figuring this out by taking the volume of x cubed rotated around and then subtracting the volume of x cubed? It does effectively end up being that way, yes. Mm -hmm. So this solid, the, the bowl, is effectively like a solid from the outside of the bowl all the way inside, minus this, a solid from the inside of the bowl all the way inside to the middle, is effectively what you're saying, yeah. What are capital R and little r? They are functions of y. In this three-dimensional picture, for a given value of y, like right there, little r is the horizontal distance from the y-axis 
to that point on the graph that's higher and capital R is the same distance plus a little more to the other graph. But careful, those distances are not x squared and x cubed. Because x squared and x cubed are the second coordinates at that point, not the first coordinate. The first coordinates are the x coordinates. I have to solve these equations for x in terms of y. If the first one, x equals square root of y, which is y to the one half. And with the second one, x is cube root of y, which is y to the one third. Those are the first coordinates of those points. And when you subtract the first coordinate to this point, which is zero, they give you those distances, those horizontal distances. Does that make sense? And you got to get, yeah, you have to get it in terms of y because we're integrating with respect to y. So this becomes, I'll, I'll factor the pi out in front, pi times the integral from zero to one, capital R, careful, corresponds to this one. That's capital R because that's the second graph that's further from the y axis. And little r corresponds to this one. That's the top graph that's closer to the y-axis. So you got to be really careful here. Capital R y is r to the, was y to the one third, and that gets squared. And little r of y is y to the one half, and that gets squared. y to the one third squared, multiply the exponents is y to the two thirds, y to the one half squared, multiply the exponents is y to the first. Now we're home free. Two thirds plus one is five thirds. When you divide by five thirds, it's the same as multiplying by three fifths. Integrate y, you get one half y squared going from zero to one. Plug in one, get three fifths minus one half. Plug in zero, get zero. Get a common denominator of 10. You're going to have 6 minus 5 over 10. Pi over 10 looks like the answer. If I've not made a mistake, just checking with the previous section to make them sure I didn't make a mistake. Yep, pi over 10. And that is about uh, 0.314 because it's pi over 10. And if I gave you units, if length was, for example, in centimeters, well, this would be a very small bowl. This would be a cubic centimeters. That'd be a very tiny bowl. You would not want to eat cereal out of it in a very tiny volume. Maybe a, a mouse or even something smaller than a mouse might eat cereal out of it. So sometimes your cross sections are not disks or circles, but they're rings, washers. That happens in the video, although I rotated around the x-axis. Here's an example where you rotate around the y-axis. Not going to give homework where you do that, but it could show up on the test. So there's some problems like that in the book. You should practice a few odd problems like that. See if you get the answer in the back of the book.